So now that we've got a background on the gross anatomy and the histology of the gastrointestinal tract and the digestive system as a whole, we can begin to talk about the physiology. And what we really need to be able to do is we need to be able to, as we consume food, break it apart, which is digestion, bring it across the uh, uh, tissue into the blood, which is uh, absorption, rather, and then move it along the whole digestive tracts to facilitate the process, which is just simply going to be referred to as gut motility or gut movement. So we're going to start out with gut movement. How do we move food that we consume from our mouth through the digestive system? And again, that movement process is going to be called motility or gut motility. And in human digestive system, there are going to be two main types of motility. And in reality, there's actually three. One of them we could clarify or qualify rather di uh, um, swallowing as a form of movement. Swallowing moves food from the mouth through the pharynx into the esophagus. Once we get into the esophagus, we no longer can swallow food further down. So we have to utilize other movements. Two main types of movements are going to be used here. The first type of movement is a type of movement called peristalsis. Peristalsis is going to move food forward in one direction. And that's what you can see here in the lower picture. So food, when you consume food, you consume a small little packet. And we're going to refer to that packet as a bolus. So this is a lump of food. The bolus is a lump of food. This bolus of food, as you swallow, enters to the esophagus. And as it enters the esophagus, which is the beginning of the GI tract, the bolus of food is going to stretch that tissue. In response to this stretch in tissue, the, the tissue stretch is acting as a stimuli. It is going to stimulate smooth muscle to change both in front of and behind the bolus. So smooth muscle behind the bolus, or that point of stretch, is going to contract. And that's what you can see here. This is the bolus of food. And behind that bolus, we have this point of contraction. Now, this is pushing pressure to allow food to move in this direction. However, in front of that bolus, if we don't do something there and relax or loosen up that tissue, we're not going to have any forward progression. So at the same time that the smooth muscle behind the stretch is contracting, the smooth muscle that is in front of the point of stretch or in front of the bolus is going to relax. So we have smooth muscle contraction behind the bolus, smooth muscle relaxation in front of the bolus, and this facilitates that movement, kind of this wave-like movement of the bolus along the digestive tract. So it causes a wave. It has a very wave-like appearance on ultrasound as that bolus travels along the tube. In fact, it's, it resembles a wave so distinctly that it's going to be referred to as the peristaltic wave. This is definitely visible on gastrointestinal ultrasound. It's also going to be 
auto work. Especially when the stomach is empty. So after you've maybe not had food for a while, maybe you're a couple hours post meal, and a lot of the food has been systematically deposited from the stomach into the lower portions of the digestive tract, you begin to have tummy noises, tummy rumbling, and that is due to the peristaltic wave as it moves the food along through the small intestine. It revor the noise reverberates back up through the stomach, and we can hear it, and we call that your stomach's growling or your tummy's rumbling. The second type of movement, first is peristalsis, the second is this movement called segmentation. Now, where peristalsis was very unidirectional, moved in one direction, segmentation is actually going to be bidirectional. Segmentation is going to occur primarily in the small intestine, I'm going to abbreviate that as the SI. So primarily in the small intestine. The small intestine will undergo random smooth muscle contraction. Random smooth muscle contraction. This random smooth muscle contraction, as it squishes down on the bolus, is going to cause that bolus to be squished in a back and forth movement. And that's what you can see going on here. So we squeeze the bolus on either side, and the bolus kind of moves back and forth. And then you add in the peristaltic wave, and you have an overall movement in one direction, but we're moving back and forth through the segmentation. Now the reason that we would use this bolus to squish, or I'm sorry, this uh, segmentation process to squish the bolus back and forth, This stimulates nutrient absorption. As I mentioned, this process is occurring primarily in the small intestine. The small intestine has that brush border or that high surface area because of the folds in the mucosa. The uh, increased surface area in the mucosa of the small intestine, as the bolus gets squished back and forth, it mixes and interacts, the food interacts more efficiently with that, uh, that mucosal surface. So that's how we're going to move food from our mouth through the digestive system. Uh, and all along the way, this is going to facilitate some additional function. And I want to break up the different functions that we have based off of the organs along the digestive tract. The esophagus really just accepts food from the mouth and then delivers it into the stomach. So we're going to pick up with stomach function. This is really one of the first places outside of the mouth where the food that's been consumed really begins to be modified. The mouth is just simply a food processor. And the teeth are going to be involved in this process. The esophagus delivers the food that's been processed by the teeth in the mouth to the stomach. And once the food enters into the stomach, going to make some major modifications here. So what does the stomach actually look like? So here's the esophagus coming in. You can see we have this thing called the cardiac sphincter, which is going to regulate release of food into the stomach. And then we have the pyloric sphincter, which release, uh, regulates the release of food from the stomach into 
the small intestine. The stomach itself, now you can see those three layers of muscle tissue, our circular layer, our oblique layer, and then our lateral layer all um, stacked together around the stomach. Inside of the stomach we have these folds and ridges that are called rugae. Uh, and again, the stomach is going to accept food as you consume a meal. And that food is put into the stomach because the stomach is a muscular and expandable sac. And because it is a expandable and muscular sac, we can consume relatively large quantities of food and we'll be able to store it in the stomach. So this is going to allow storage. The stomach takes the meal bolus and will expand to accommodate a large volume of food. It's going to expand the whole up to three liters in the average adult. So about three liters of food can be processed through the mouth and emptied into the stomach. After the meal, the stomach will slowly shrink as the digested material is delivered into the small intestine over a prolonged period of time. The stomach is also going to aid in digestion. And in fact, the stomach is one of our more important sites for protein digestion. So protein digestion. Protein digestion is going to require a higher acidic environment. The uh, stomach is definitely under a strong environmental uh, pH influence, so we have strong acids that are in the stomach. Uh, in addition to facilitating protein digestion, this strong acid environment is also important to kill any bacteria that have maybe entered into the digestive system from the meal that has just been consumed. And so it's somewhat protective as those bacteria are going to be killed. Now, the protein also needs to basically be battered and beaten up in order to break down effectively in the presence of enzymes and acids in the stomach. And so our extra layers of muscle, the three layers of muscle here, we're going to have contraction of the stomach occurring in a variety of different directions or vectors, and this supports this mechanical breakdown process. So we'll have mechanical digestion that occurs here as well. So we're exposing food to a higher acidic environment, and we're also squeezing on that food, and this is going to help to break the food up. The last thing that the stomach is going to do here is it is going to provide timed delivery into the small intestine. So even though we consume, you know, roughly for most of us about three meals a day, and those three meals a day contain um, uh, anywhere from 500 to 1,000 calories most of the time and take about 20 minutes for uh, an individual to consume, maybe a little longer, maybe a little bit less. Because we have time delivery, we actually can slowly deliver that 500 to 1,000 calorie bolus that we consumed in 20 minutes over a prolonged period of time, five or six hours, instead of... 20 minutes, and then you have five or six hours of no food that's being released into the small intestine. One of the questions that is actually really important to ask is, you know, if food is basically tissue from other plants and animals, and we're using things like acids and high, uh, uh, or really low pH, to break down those food sources from animals and plants, 
why is the stomach, which is also tissue like what we find in plants and animals, why is the stomach itself not broken down? And the answer to that question is because we have a layer over the stomach or lining the lumen of the stomach that's called the mucosal membrane. The mucosal membrane. And in this picture here that I'm showing you, what I'm illustrating is that layer of the stomach. And so you can see we've taken a small little piece of the stomach here. This is the basement membrane. So this is the outside of the organ. And this is going to be what faces into the lumen of the stomach. And what you can see is we have our different layers of muscle. We have connective tissue with blood supply. And then we have this layer of tissue here, the mucosa, which is going to form what we can call a mucosal membrane on the surface, on the luminal surface of the mucosa. This mucosal membrane is going to be produced because the mucosa contains, mil of the stomach contains millions of small pits. Millions of small pits. And that's what you're looking at here. They're called gastric pits or gastric glands. gastric pits or gastric glands. In this figure here, we're, back, we're basically zooming in in closer, higher and higher details. We move from left to right on the cells that make up this tissue. So within the gastric glands, we are going to facilitate the production of protein digesting enzymes and also produce a solution that is going to protect the surface of the stomach so that it's not digested itself. So these gastric glands are glands or exocrine in function, and they produce digestive enzymes. And these digestive enzymes are going to be facilitated by three cell types. So we're going to use three different cells to generate these enzymes that are going to aid in the whole process of protein breakdown and also will aid in the process of protecting the stomach from being digested itself. One of the cells that's going to be present is an acid secreting cell. That acid secreting cell is going to secrete an acid called hydrochloric acid, which if you're familiar with acids and bases, you'll recognize hydrochloric acid is a very strong acid. We're also going to have mucus secreting cells, which will generate and secrete mucus. And then finally, we have pepsinogen secreting cells. Now, mucus secreting cells are going to secrete mucus, which is that protective layer. The acid secreting cells secrete hydrochloric acid, which helps in denaturing proteins. And the reason we want to denature those proteins or take proteins that are in this sort of compact structure, denature them into more of a linear structure, is this opens up so that enzymes can attack that protein at a variety of different places to break it apart. The main enzyme that we're going to use here is an enzyme called pepsinogen. This is going to be a protein digesting enzyme. And will help to facilitate the breakdown of protein from its linear structure into individual amino acids. Now, these three cells generate their solutions and it mixed together in a cocktail. That cocktail is better known as gastric juice, which I know is kind of a gross name, but I'm the same, gastric juice. As food enters into the stomach, the food is going to be mixed with 
the acids and enzymes that are being produced. The protein component of that food that's going to be consumed is going to interact with those acids and those enzymes, and the protein, which are long chains of amino acids, are going to be broken down into individual amino acids. And I'm going to just simply refer to amino acid as uh, AA, and I'm just going to abbreviate it as AA. Now, as this process occurs, so you have contraction of the stomach on the food, you have mixing of this gastric juice cocktail into the food, proteins being digested, other molecules are being broken down, we end up with a form of food that no longer resembles what you ate. It's more of a liquid solution now, and it's called chyme. So we're going to form chyme. And it's chyme that's going to be the mixture that will leave the stomach and enter into the small intestine. Now, before we begin to move into the small intestine, one last thing. I want to make sure that everybody is clear on The stomach is going to be lined with mucus from those mucus producing cells that add to the mixture of the gastric juice. So mucus lays over the surface of the stomach, over the surface of the luminal wall of the stomach. And as long as that mucus layer is intact, it is protective against the highest acidic and enzymatic environment we find inside of the lumen of the stomach. If it's not intact, you may recognize that we begin to actually digest the stomach wall, and we would call that condition something like an ulcer. Okay, so let's talk just a little bit about the chyme. The chyme is what's going to be released into the small intestine, and this is done in a regulated way. We move chyme into the small intestine in a regulated way. The way that we're going to regulate this, you've got to imagine that this stomach is loaded up with chyme that's being broken down and digested. Then we have this smooth muscle ring called a sphincter that's at the base of the stomach that leads into the duodenum, which is the upper portion of the small intestine. The pyloric sphincter is going to open up and allow a small amount of food to leak into or to move into the duodenum, and then it will contract back down, closing up um, the stomach, preventing additional chyme from entering into, into the small intestine. So chyme is regulated regulated uh, or released by a regulated mechanism into the small intestine through the pyloric sphincter. And just like all of our other sphincters, sphincter is a term that's used to describe a smooth muscle ring. And so it acts as a drawstring closure. So when food is required to move into the small intestine, we're going to stimulate the pyloric sphincter to open, releasing small amount or a bolus, again, a bolus of, of uh, chyme into the small intestine. Now at this point, everything that's happened has just simply been movement and the breakdown or digestion of food. We actually haven't begun any sort of absorptive process. So we've not gained any sort of energy or calories from a meal that's been consumed between the mouth and the stomach. Now we're beginning to release this mixture called chyme into the small intestine. So let's pick up here with small intestine function. Okay, so small intestine function. Small intestine is going to have two major functions. And you're probably already sort of guessing one of them is going to be digestion, which is further breakdown of 
food into macromolecule ingredients. And then the second function is going to be nutrient absorption. Once we've broken down food into individual molecules and we have it broken down enough, we can begin to absorb it. The digestive process in the small intestine, we're actually going to have some additional protein breakouts. So proteins are going to be further broken down into individual amino acids. Small intestine is going to provide additional carbohydrate and lipid digestion. Carbohydrates are going to be mixed with another amylase. You remember salivary amylase from the beginning of um, this lecture on digestive system physiology. As we chewed food, it was mixed with saliva. Saliva contains salivary amylase, and that amylase, called salivary amylase, helped to begin the process of breaking down starch into individual glucose. As chyme enters into the small intestine, the pancreas releases its gastric juice. And not only does it contain bicarbonate, it also contains a pancreatic amylase that's going to continue the process of breaking down carbohydrates. We're also going to have bile from the gallbladder that's released into the duodenum, into the small intestine, that upper portion of the small intestine, to facilitate lipid digestion. So more proteins are being digested into amino acids, carbohydrates are being further broken down, lipids are being further processed. And this is all due to additional enzymes that are being added to the lumen of the small intestine. And these are enzymes are coming both from the pancreas itself and also the small intestine itself. Now, the digestion that's occurring here in the small intestine is not mechanical breakdown. We're not chewing. We're not squeezing on it like squeezing on the food like we did with the stomach. We're actually mixing in enzymes. And so this is a point of chemical digestion. Now, as we further break down food, pretty soon we're going to have individual amino acids. We're going to have individual glucose molecules, individual lipids. And these molecules are going to now be small enough where they can be absorbed into the bloodstream. So the second major function of the small intestine is to act in nutrient absorption. Now again, in order for absorption to occur, our macromolecules, which there are four, they're going to be carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids, these macromolecules, which in cells are formed into larger structures, they're going to need to be broken down from their larger structures, which are called poly or polymer structures. So we have polysaccharides, and we have polypeptides, and we have polynucleotides. So these are going to need to be broken down into smaller fractional components such as a monosaccharide, which is glucose. The polysaccharide is starch or glycogen. Now we're breaking down that polysaccharide form of starch and glycogen into the monosaccharide form of glucose. We have to get all of our different molecules down to that mono size, monosaccharides, um, individual amino acids, and mononucleotides before we can go through the digestive process. Uh, I'm sorry, the absorption process, rather. And the reason that we have to do that is larger molecules just don't cross cell membranes and cell walls very easily. So we need small molecules in order to travel to the bloodstream. It is within the 10 feet of the small intestine that we're going to have 90% of all absorption. So 90% of the uh, absorbable nutrients that are consumed in your diet are going to enter the bloodstream through the small intestine. The small intestine has three anatomical regions. And I've already extensively referred to one of these regions. And by the way, these anatomic regions, they are going to be defined not on their anatomy, but rather on their function or on their physiology. Okay, so here's a picture of the small intestine. 
and this is where the stomach would be, and then this is where we lead into the large intestine. So the small intestine has three anatomical regions that vary by function. The first about 10 inches or so of most individuals' small intestine is called the duodenum. So about the first 10 inches of the small intestine is the duodenum. Now these first 10 inches are primarily going to be responsible for further digestion, further uh, chemical breakdown of food. From the duodenum, the second two portions of the small intestine are going to be the jejunum in the middle and then the ileum at the end. And this is approximately 10 additional feet. The jejunum and the ileum collectively are our absorption portions of the small intestine. So as we move from the duodenum into the jejunum and the ileum, what we're going to notice is that the luminal wall increases in the number of villi that are present. And these are those microscopic folds in the mucosa that are going to help to facilitate an increase in surface area. So it makes sense that this would be our primary site of absorption because we have higher surface area, which means more efficient contact between macromolecules and the mucosal wall. Now, in addition to the villi, which are those microscopic folds in the mucosa, the individual cells that make up the mucosa, their membranes are also going to exhibit small folds. And as you probably can guess, these microvilli, so villi is the tissue, microvilli are going to be small folds in the individual cells, they are going to further increase the small intestine surface area. So this is where we're going to facilitate most of our food absorption or nutrient absorption through the jejunum and the ileum. And by the time food gets here into the cecum, which is the first portion of the large intestine, it's going to be primarily nutrient devoid or devoid of nutrients. About 10% of nutrients, additional nutrients, including water, is going to be removed from the chyme, the processed food throughout the large intestine, but mostly the food has already been transported into the bloodstream through the small intestine by the time it enters into the large intestine. So the last thing that I want to discuss with the digestive system is nutrition. In other words, what types of foods should we be consuming for optimal human health? And you may actually be a little bit surprised because there are going to be some things that you're going to be surprised that you should be eating and other things that you're surprised that you are eating that maybe should, you shouldn't be eating or vice versa. So when we consider food in the United States for humans, we use what are called nutrition guidelines. And nutrition guidelines have changed recently. The most current nutrition guideline for Americans is a set of guidelines referred to as Choose My Plate. And this is one of Michelle Obama's initiatives. And when she became the first lady, she looked at nutritional habits and diseases in individuals in the United States and said, hey, we need to modify our food consumption. It replaced, or choose my plate, replaced a food nutritional guideline called my pyramid. So choose my plate replaced my pyramid. This is what choose my plate actually looks like, and you probably actually have seen this. 
um, there are figures of Choose My Plate that are up in um, the calf here at TMC uh, that helps, should help you to choose uh, appropriate foods to consume. The old pyramid was my pyramid, or the old food guide was my pyramid, and it looked like this, and you can see that you had five main food groups, and then the width of each of these triangles was related to how much food or how many calories should be consumed from each of these different types of food groups. And actually, one of them that's not listed down here is this small little yellow triangle, and that's just simply going to be sweets and oils. Notice also what's on the side of the pyramid here. We've got a stairway and an individual climbing that stairway, and that represents that not only is it about the food that we put in, but also the energy that we expend through physical activity and exercise. So if I go back to choose my plate, you can see that basically fruits, grains, vegetables, proteins, and dairy are present. And you come back to the uh, choose my pyramid, or I'm sorry, my pyramid, um, the old food guideline, and the only difference is that proteins are now referred to simply as meats and beans, and milk is referred to as dairy. Everything else is basically the same, fruits, vegetables, and grains. Uh, one other significant difference is my pyramid had exercise central to the pyramid in the food guide, whereas choose my plate is just in reference to food. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. So either way, whether it's choose my plate or uh, uh, the my pyramid that's been replaced we really have food categorized into five groups one of the groups is going to be grains and we are going to have whole grains that are preferred So grains, including whole grains. The next group is vegetables. The next group is fruits. And then we have dairy, was referred to as simply as milk products or milk on the my pyramid. And then last, meats and beans, or what now is referred to as just simply protein or protein source. The new pyramid, I'm sorry, the new, I keep calling it pyramid, the new um, guide has no reference to oils. And so it's eliminated this small little triangle here. So it eliminates oils and other sweets. The new food guide also really doesn't have physical activity directly associated with your eating habits. So if we go back again here to choose my plate, you'll no longer see any reference of physical activity. It's no longer on the guideline. However, the old guidelines, my pyramid, physical activity was central. This recognizes that it's not just about calories consumed, but it's also about calories expended. If you want to see more information, and you're going to have to do this, you're going to be preparing a health and wellness plan as a component of this course, Human Biology, BI-103. And you're going to want to visit the website, choosemyplate.gov. And that's going to give you some more information on everything that goes into Choose My Plate. Now, why did we choose to go from choose my, or my pyramid to choose my plate? Why have we made this transition? Well, part of it is because right now in the United States, and you've all have heard this before, we are in the middle of an epidemic, and it's called the obesity epidemic. 
So the obesity epidemic, and I'm putting quotes around there because it's a term, obesity epidemic, and I'm going to do one more thing here. I'm going to put a question mark next to obesity epidemic. And I'm going to put a question mark around the obesity epidemic for one reason in particular. And that's because I actually am questioning if we really have an obesity epidemic. Now, I'm going to show you some maps here in just a minute. What I'm not saying is that we have, uh, that we don't have an obesity problem in the United States. Absolutely, we have an obesity problem in the United States. However, epidemic is a term that's used to describe the over prevalence of a disease causing process within a population. And what I'm going to about to do for the next 20 minutes or so is I am going to discuss this term obesity epidemic and I'm going to try to show you through scientific evidence that we really don't have an obesity epidemic, but the epidemic rather lies someplace else.